I drove through thick woods to get to Common Castle. The entire trip was like a long song of dark memories, interspersed with numerous faces glowing a violent red. The notes of the song started softly enough, but ended huge and solemn, churning and shaking like gigantic things dying slowly beneath the earth. I was relieved when my destination emerged, melting from the woods like a sickening fog. The town was just a specter of old wood and stone, piled up in a dreary, half-sleeping sort of way. The place was almost entirely given over to the woods, just a plaything for the scrub brush and thickets, a cast-off mask of man resting in a web of brambles, with broken branches and dandelions poking through its eye holes. Despite the new focus of my attention, I could still hear the last bits of my journey sinking further into subterranean song, playing to an unforgiving audience outlined in blood and scowls. I sought out the small apartment I had arranged for previously. The interior seemed carved from the city's long-lost past, better suited for a ghost. I unpacked the tools of my trade and immediately napped for a few hours, hoping to shake loose the journey's dark song. My sleep was plagued by countless hands, each one busy sorting through my mind. It felt like my entire being had been broken down into tiny pieces and placed on a conveyor belt. Pale fingers plucked my thoughts from the moving belt and lifted them into the darkness to be examined by inhuman eyes. I could even hear the rusty grinding of a machine, no doubt a proven creature of metal that oversaw my orderly deconstruction. My mind, divided between two receptacles of rusty steel, was at last reorganized. I woke up. I had been in town for mere hours and had already experienced one of the signature phenomenons alleged to haunt it. The processing. I thought the dream merely the echo of a myth, as I'd refreshed my memory of the various legends surrounding Common Castle only days before my arrival. Feeling renewed and ready to get on with things, I let my concerns linger where they may. As I made my way to the street, my drawing materials packed neatly into my messenger bag, twilight filled the once empty lanes with long and lanky shadows. No one but myself seemed to be about. Darkness fell while I wandered the city. Those I encountered were few and furtive, dodging behind ruined buildings and into black alleyways. I soon realized darkness was something the city had long forgotten how to ward off. Only a few streets heard the minute buzz of electric light. Eventually, I came to a small empty park, a few struggling lanterns pouring pools of orange on the ground. The scene appeared more than adequate for my purposes, so I sat upon a rickety picnic table and withdrew an art pad. All around me a slight breeze played, sometimes displaying my drawings to the grass and I found the experience of sketching in a darkened, haunted town quite thrilling. However, after tonight, I hoped I would have no further use for the remaining tools still reposed within my bag. I drew for hours, it seemed, when in fact I had fallen asleep. That cool, whispering breeze must have been too much for me, and so I dreamed. It wasn't necessarily the terrible dream so many others reported having. It was rather beautiful, like a graveyard thickly frosted in autumn moonlight. In this dream, I was still situated in the park, precisely at the spot I occupied before sleep took me. Yet the world around me had changed. It had grown far darker than any waking world would have allowed, as even the softest shadow seemed deeper than a rabbit hole. I also noticed that the once autumnal trees were now without their coats of brightly colored leaves. Yet despite their lack of foliage, they were certainly not without attire. They were wrapped in membranous black silk, a doubtful substance that wavered between solidity and liquescence. The material was everywhere, seeming to hang upon the night sky as the breeze informed it with unwholesome shapes. 
I focused my gaze downward and realized that I too was covered in the stuff. It came away easily enough, but it didn't blow away as it should have. It became a twisting black shape that resisted the push of the dreaming wind. Even in my sleep, I realized I was experiencing another well-known common castle secret. The Culling. I knew the shape would soon resemble me, so I waited for my features to reproduce themselves upon the shifting mass. Within seconds, if time means anything at all within a dream, I stood before myself. While the resulting creature looked like me in every detail, the simulacrum was considerably fouler than me, a more concentrated version of my worst possible self. I smiled when I saw the knife appear in its right hand. At the same time, my own right hand seemed to lose a practiced dexterity. I took a moment to soak in the darkness around me, knowing for a few fleeting moments I breathed the air of the twisted city of Dystoria. My twin took a last look at me, a disgusted scowl on its face, and departed into the darkness. I awoke to the whispered glow of dawn and quickly gathered my things, making my way back to my borrowed residence. Only one more dream to go, and my business would be concluded. The day was unspectacular, as the nighttime had shown me far more than sunlight ever could. I sketched and painted for most of the day, assuring my lethargy when the time came. Occasionally, I would hear the footsteps of persons traveling the sidewalk beyond my high windows, moving with a peculiar gait. I was unbothered by their staggering presence, as they always kept to themselves. I was far more interested in the sketches I was working on. They were unusual subjects for me. Forests and sunsets. Eventually, finding my curiosity too great to resist, I walked through the thick woods to Common Castle's twisted reflection, Distoria. The city was supposed to be less than two decades old, yet it looked like it had risen from the earth itself hundreds of years ago. It indeed appeared to be the exact, yet considerably more perverse, duplicate of Common Castle in every regard. It certainly lived up to its reputation, which was what I was betting on. I was eager to see what the dark twin of my room might look like, so I walked to the Distorian version of the house where I had rented the apartment. The building was precisely where it should have been, but like the rest of the city's aesthetic departures from its twin, it swelled with monstrous features. Gargoyle-like shapes reached out from above door frames and chimney stones, Strange statues rose from the loam of the courtyard, and the building materials looked as if they were derived from more humanoid sources, rather than quarried stone and milled wood. I entered the structure despite the fear that began to grip me, yet I deserved to feel fear. It was only fair. Light clearly wasn't welcome anywhere in the house. The ample windows seemed no more capable of admitting it than the walls. I imagined the night left a bit of itself behind after each of its many cyclical visits. One day, the innards of the house would most likely appear blacker than tar. That suited me just fine. I would never be back. When I entered my room, the first thing I noticed were the paintings spread out on the desk. They were painfully and shamefully familiar. Face after face, red as twilight. Yet it meant that it was all working. I took some solace in that. The images stared from drawing paper yellowed with age and lined with cracks. If I hadn't known better, I would have assumed they were decades old. Yet it didn't matter what they looked like or how old they were. I was almost done. The shadows around the house began to overflow as the night fell from the sky. I needed to return to my room and dream. Back at my apartment in Common Castle, I looked to my crumpled bag next to the bed, wondering what might remain inside it. I gazed out the window beyond the woods, aware that I was facing the window of the doppelganger room I had recently departed. I could even feel something trying to look back at me, if only through dimly constructed and incomplete eyes. 
I stretched out on the bed, put my head on the pillow, and dreamed the third dream. It's difficult to say what I experienced that night, save that I was filled with the last nightmares I would ever have. I saw so many faces burning like small red stars just before they disappeared altogether from my conscience. Something locked me to an old rusted chair somewhere in the basement of the world. A knife slid across my throat, and I bled pure red venom into a rusted bucket. After I was drained to the last, I saw a gigantic paintbrush tipped with old haggard bristles dip itself into my blood. Upon the yellowed paper that stretched before me, I saw my image painted. Once more, I was face to face with myself. I think he expected me to scream. All I could utter was thank you. I awoke, and the curing was complete. As I packed up my things to leave, I hefted my bag into the air. It was light as a baby's breath, and so was I. My trip back home was filled with the silence of forgotten faces and the lightness of an emptied conscience. I marveled at the turning leaves of autumn. It's been three years since I left Common Castle, and in that time, I've married and had a child. I work a normal job, and I sleep through the night. I still paint, but now only the beauty of nature moves across my canvas. Of course, the Red Rembrandt killings continue unabated, but far more violent and gruesome than before. And the portraits of the victims, always painted in their own curdling blood, grow increasingly more realistic. But now, unlike before, I have nothing to do with any of it. Thanks to that dark town, I am free. <laughs>